Well, Ramon and Greg from DocuSign. My, um, my name is, what, your name? My name is Ramon. I'm coming from Barcelona. I'm working at DocuSign as a software architect. Oh, sorry. Microphone. <laughs> yes. Because we don't have the remote control. No, exactly. Uh, I'm coming from Barcelona. Uh, I work at DocuSign as a software architect. And, and now and he is. Yeah, my name is Greg Robbins. I'm the technical director of e-commerce at DocuSign. Uh, as Ramon said, we worked, uh, we worked together actually the last couple of years on a lot of projects, both here and uh, in San Francisco and in Barcelona, uh, e-commerce related projects, marketing, uh, lead acquisition related products. Um, and right now we're working on some exciting Django uh, projects for, for DocuSign for customer support and uh, lead acquisition. So we are looking for Django developers who'd like to come to San Francisco and work with us, just so you know can come uh, catch up with us after the uh, presentation if you'd like more information on that. So, um, so for this talk, we're, we're going to talk about a pretty complex subject about uh, setting up uh, development environments. Uh, we've created a, actually Ramon has created an awesome uh, repository that contains a full tutorial with extremely detailed step-by-step you know, Ramon dash VVV is yes, kind of how, v, 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 how he v, v. does things. But it, it's really helpful because uh, it walks you through every step of of uh, installing the different components that you would need for this. Uh, it also contains this presentation, so I would uh, recommend you grab that at some point. Okay, so talking about reproducible environments, who should care? Um, well, developers care. Developers uh, write code that need to run on some sort of environment, on some sort of environment. Uh, developers usually want to write code. Uh, we like to write code. We don't like mucking about with environments. Nope. Well, I do. But, well, you do. You're but that's, weird. That's, I'm just kind of strange. <coughs> um, team leads. So as a team lead, I really like reproducible environments because I know that my team can get down to uh, working on their, their tasks instead of crapping around with broken environments and strange bugs that appear because things aren't consistent from one place to the next. Uh, SysOps people uh, tend to appreciate this a lot because uh, the work that we do when we're setting up a development environment for an application can also be applied to... Uh, to staging, tests, production environments as well. And just kind of geeky people in general. I can see four really geeky people there that I know. But um, in general, people that are involved in Django projects can, can probably benefit from, from having a, a way to set up environments. Uh, so, so why is it important? Um, you know, a typical project is going to have lots of software packages. It's going to have a, maybe a database. Maybe it's going to have a web server. It's going to have some caching system. It's going to have... A, a queue of some sort. I don't know. There's there's myriad things Bro, that you know. Django things. itself, Python, uh, all kinds of different software packages. Um, setting, setting these things up manually, uh, while there are some people that are kind of strange that enjoy doing this, mm -hmm. like myself, uh, it is pretty slow. It tends to be inaccurate because I may do it a different way than he does it, than she does it, than he does it, uh, and we end up with different environments that that aren't accurate. They aren't consistent across. You know, across the board. And most people generally find this to be really boring work anyway. So um, it can really turn into a nightmare when you have a team. Last year, Ramon and I, when we were in Barcelona doing a project, we had a remote team in, in South America that they were pretty good coders, but they, they really didn't have much of an idea about environments. And they, I think that if we had had this system that we have now to just create a Git, a Git repository with all the stuff you need to set up in environment, two weeks. we would have saved two weeks mm -hmm. off the you know, lead time off of our project. So, and probably a lot of problems going forward too, because every time we installed a new, like we figured out we needed caching in the yeah. system. We, hey, you guys, you got to install caching. We'd have to write this tutorial about how to install caching, and then they'd break it. And then it was just we could have saved all of that by by using this exact same system here. Um, your environments can change, uh, you know, from one from one realm to another, like development's not going to be the same as staging. It's not going to be the same as production. Maybe in development I have some sort of debugger running uh, where I probably wouldn't have that in production. Sure. Although I, I do know a guy who did that, but that's another. I it's can tell talk. you over beer later if you want. I'll tell you. It's horrific. Uh, and these, these, develop, these environments also change over time, right? Like, I mean, our applications are awesomely fast. But when they're not fast enough, maybe we need to introduce some sort of caching mechanism. So that's a change that maybe happens uh, later on in the, in the software development lifecycle. Correct. Um, so we need reproducible environments. I think I've uh, belabored the point quite a bit. 
Um, I want to spin up these new instances in, in just minutes, and not hours or days or, well, days. or weeks. weeks. Yeah. Even. I want consistent results from them. And, and I want all of this in, in version control so that we can track it, share it, update it. <clears throat> um, so when we talk about setting up the reduce, re, reproducible environments, um, and this presentation here, we, we're going to talk about the tools, uh, what they do, um, some best practices, at least according, according to, to us. Yeah. 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 This is what, so we're not uh, gurus. Of we're, no, we're not, we're not gurus. <clears throat> we're really nice guys, um, but we're not you know, world-class experts on this. We're just sharing with you the uh, system that we've used that has worked for us and has given us pretty consistently good results. Um, you were sharing with you the Git repo that has our the complete written tutorial dash VVV that Ramon put together, which is awesome. And we're not going to really look at a whole lot of code right now. So as like I said, we're not covering Django development here. This is more about environments. Uh, we're not going to look at the code. And we're also not going to talk about DocuSign too much more. So the, um, what are the kind of problems we have that we need to solve? We have multiple dependencies. We need specific software versions. We probably don't have installation and configuration skills across the board on our team. Some people do. Some people don't. Uh, they shouldn't really be that concerned with it anyway. Setup can take a long time, and we have deadlines. So the solution, the solution is having a single place where the entire environment is defined. I want this under version control, able to be able to make and apply changes over time, and um, you know, have it reusable as much as possible for different environments as we go from dev to staging to production. Uh, Vagrant and Chef Solo is what we need. Yeah. And, well, probably a visual designer for our presentations because that's not what we're good at. So, uh, Ramon, you want to talk a little bit about the toolbox? Yeah, okay. okay. So, the toolbox. The toolbox, uh, the tools we're going to use uh, mainly Virtual Box. Virtual Box, it's a software that will allow us to create uh, virtual machines. Uh, Git, everybody knows Git, next. Uh, and Vagrant. Vagrant, it's uh, just a kind of software that wraps around uh, Virtual Box. It, allows us to script how do we want to provision a machine. Uh, Vagrant starts with uh, vanilla boxes. Vanilla boxes meaning that they are bare bones. Uh, they have nothing installed but the main operating system. Uh, one thing that it's awesome is that it offers a shared directory so you can run your application from the virtual machine but you edit your application from your host with your preferred uh, with your preferred editor for example I don't know uh, PyCharm or Vim um, uh, Subversion or Vim. yeah Vim. Em Emacs no not Emacs okay no. okay 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 is Nina out there yeah we don't like Emacs no Nina was there <laughs> she left and we said no. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so that you can code in local, uh, run on the virtual machine. And then uh, the two preferred commands, Greg commands. My favorite commands. Yeah, your this, favorite commands. Yeah, so it's like the whip cracker on my team, right? I like, all you have to do when, to get these development environments up and running is download the repository and go in and type vagrant up and it will spin up the fully working virtual machine. You don't have to spend any more time configuring, mucking about. Just two lines, or two words, and you've got the machine up and running. And the other one is Vagrant Provision, which Correct. is when we've made some changes to that environment, Vagrant Provision will apply all of the, uh, it will make the virtual machine match what you've defined in your, in your chef code. And I think now would be a great time in order to spin up our demo machine. Yeah. OK, Thanks. so we can see all of that. Sorry, I need to do this. Okay. Uh, just that. Uh, in the tutorial, it's explained what does node mean, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, what we're doing is uh, background add and saying, uh, as long as you are waking up the, the virtual machine, just provision it, okay? Uh, by, the end of the, by the end of the speech, we will see if it has worked or not. It might even work, yeah. Mm, okay. It might do it. Okay, so that's uh, Vagrant, and why we like Vagrant? Uh, we like open source tools. So Vagrant, it's an open source tool, and we like it. It allows to do uh, whatever we want with virtual machine. Uh, it's very well uh, adapted to virtual box, which is also a virtual, uh, an open source tool. Uh, there are a lot of ready-made boxes, Ubuntu, CentOS, uh, whatever flavor of Linux uh, that you can imagine. Uh, 
if you want, you can also work with Windows, so it's cool. And you can create your own base boxes uh, in an easy way, in a very easy way. Uh, the other tool we have in our toolbox is Chef. Uh, okay, what does Chef? Uh, if Vagrant is able to spin up a machine, Chef, what does it provision this machine? Install some software inside that, uh, in the, into that virtual machine. But in a way that we as developers like maybe uh, more than if we were just CSOPs. It's uh, doing code. With Chef, you can do whatever you can do in the command line. Uh, you can create files, directories, delete them, and whatever. I don't care. Uh, it's easy to keep track of your configuration changes. Uh, it's easy to keep track uh, in Git, so you can then uh, share those changes with all your team, and you get sure that all your team will have just the same configuration uh, for their development machine, uh, for example. And Chef uh, makes all of that accessible through, through the network uh, using a server, okay? So, What's the main difference between Chef and Chef Solo? Chef Solo is just an open source port to Chef. Uh, it has no server, uh, no, no server side, no server component. It's much more easy to get started with, and it has a plugin for Vagrant that just works. So it's great to get started with that. So I'd like to comment, you know, there that so Chef is not a simple system. I mean, it's. Um, I think that we've given you that we'll, we'll be giving you the steps in the in the tutorial in the repository of how to get up and running, and you can kind of see it laid out in a single tutorial how all the pieces fit together, which is something we couldn't find out on the out on the internet. Um, but anything that you know we could do to simplify at the beginning was a big help. So you know, removing the server component from Chef uh, simplified a great deal. Having said that, you know, we do like that that Chef has the server because as we evolve our projects and we evolve our, our environment's definitions, we'll probably want to use some variation of those on staging, test, and production environments. So all that work that we've done is going to be usable later on in, in Chef Server, which is what we, we do use it at DocuSign. We use Chef Server to provision uh, different environments for our, for our product. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Uh, so why do we like Chef and Chef Solo? Mainly by the same reason that we like it, uh, Vagrant, because it's open source. Uh, as a big company, there are some times that we uh, may need uh, support. It's uh, a paid support. It's available for Chef, so that's cool. Uh, it just gets integrated very well with VirtualBox. It's very widely used. There are a lot of, it works with lots of operating systems. Uh, you can have a lot of cookbooks ready made in order to just get started with it. And Chef Solo, it's great for local environments. So you can start learning right uh, after download that component. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that I, you know, like for it is, uh, you know, if I'm running a team or if I'm if I'm running an organization, is you know, again, the fact that you can get you can get professional support from from Ops Code, which is the company that makes Chef. I mean, they make this. Uh, actually, they've been bombarding my email box for the last month, constantly trying to get me to buy this. But um, and they also have training available, so that you know, if you do get serious, that you want to move forward with this, you know, across different parts of your development organization, that uh, they can provide uh, you know training by experts on it, so that make sure that you're using it in the in the most proper way. Yeah. So after all that, uh, what we're trying to achieve, <clears throat> what we're trying to achieve is just to spin up a virtual machine that runs the polls in Catalan, my model tongue, that means lies. Uh, yeah. Uh, the polls application, yes. Uh, and to do that. My head itches just thinking about that word, sorry. Yeah, polls. Yeah, well, lies. <laughs> And for that, we just use uh, an Ubuntu server, 12.04, an uh, Nginx. It's not used in the... Uh, in so he's the, scratching, too. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> in the original tutorial. But it's interesting to, the, to have one of those. Uh, Python, Django, and PostgreSQL, as in Nginx. It's just to make things really interesting. Yeah. Okay? So what do we need to do all of that? Uh, we need to have installed in our host machine. We need to have installed Ruby. The Chef Development Kit, VirtualBox, uh, Vagrant, Git, uh, all the tools that we have been talking about. Uh, you can find in the tutorial all the links to those uh, applications. And 
What are the two main parts that are implied uh, when creating a virtual machine? Uh, we need the Vagrant file. The Vagrant file is the file that is created by Vagrant when you, use, uh, when you initialize it. And it will tell Vagrant how to create the virtual machine, okay? And we need that Chef Kitchen. Uh, Chef Kitchen will say, what are the software that we need to get installed into the virtual machine? Okay, it looks... We're gonna go into all this yeah. detail in a minute. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, the application we want to run, okay? So what is a Vagrant file? A Vagrant file just defines a virtual machine. And how, how is a virtual machine is defined? Just put in the required plugins that you may have installed for Vagrant, just saying how you want the network configuration for your virtual machine, the processors, whatever you can define in, uh, in VirtualBox, you can define it in a script in a Vagrant file. And to sum it to it, uh, a Vagrant file is a Ruby script. So you can use all the power of Ruby just, just yep. for that file. So just script it up. Yeah, it's scripted. So as it's a script, it's very easy to keep track of it and whatever. Yeah. I think that part you like it more. Oh, because I, this is my uh, attempt at artwork here. Uh, I'm actually a pretty good guitar player, but uh, visual design is not my thing. So, um, so talking about Chef, like Chef has these kind of main concepts, and they're really cute names that all fit together. They have kitchen, and then they have cookbooks, and then they have recipes, and then they have the knife. So we'll just talk a little bit about what those are. Um, a kitchen contains many cookbooks. A, a kitchen, it's like a project, right? A single project usually has a single kitchen. Um, cookbooks are collections of recipes. So you can get predefined cookbooks from, for common tasks. Uh, actually, you get them from the chef supermarket, as it's called, um, or from Git repos, or you can create your own. A, a cookbook is like a collection of um, related tasks. So you could have like an Apache cookbook, right? To install Apache, set up virtual hosts, set permissions, create the log files, blah, blah, blah. Or a MySQL cookbook that would do all these things related to setting up a, a, a MySQL server. Right? Um, <clears throat> recipes are just specific instructions that uh, are contained in the cookbook to do certain things, right? Um, and then there's also the, the command line tool for using Chef, which is called Knife, right? Uh, and I guess, you know, following along with this, the application that you're going to serve up would be the main course, right? Um, do you want to talk about the Berg shelf and Berg's file? Yeah, let's talk about Berg shelf and Berg's file. Uh, Berg shelf unfortunately is, don't have like food names. But. No, uh, but Berg shelf is just a dependency manager. Think about Berg shelf as you could think about pip, uh, apt-get, or whatever. Uh, and the Berg file just lists what cookbooks we will need, uh, do we will need in order to install inside the virtual machine. As the, the structure of the file is quite simple. You see, there's a source. Uh, source line that says, uh, I want all those cookbooks uh, downloaded from supermarketketchup.com. You define what cookbooks do you want in the verse file. Uh, for example, for the APT cookbook, we want uh, uh, the 2.5.2 .2 version. Uh, but not all every cookbook has to be downloaded from the source. You have defined. You can say, hey, I want the PostgreSQL cookbook to be downloaded from a Git repo. Okay, or uh, even a path, a path in your, uh, a path in your, in your hard disk, okay, in your disk. That, I don't know, yeah, I don't know how to say that. Yeah, uh, in your local, okay. Right. So, like, we made one there that's, uh, yeah, it's, that's a, it's, it's a cookbook that's going to install the polls app, right? So, like, as you can see, it just points to the current directory site cookbooks poll app. Exactly, so, kinds of. Uh, so you can grab cookbooks kind of from everywhere, and Berkshelf is where you manage those dependencies. Berkshelf, in fact, gets installed with the ChefDK that we have set uh, before we need it in order to start uh, our adventure. Okay. So uh, I, I created this another um, fine attempt at graphic art uh, where I kind of lined up the cute chef <laughs> names with what they really are. So, you know, you can take a look at that. Kitchens are projects. Cookbooks are like a story. Uh, you know, a group of related tasks. Recipe would be a specific task. Knife is the command line tool. The Berg shelf is dependency management for. Yes, because when you're new to the to the to the chef wall, it, it can be quite confusing the terminology yes. that it's used. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I would like to have that to have had that at the beginning. Right. Okay? Yeah, we uh, we <clears throat> suffered a little bit with that. You know, yeah. it, it's pretty clever the way they've thought of the naming conventions, but it's a it's a little it's a lot to digest at first. Yes. 
lot. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry. So once we create the kitchen, what we will find in it? We will find environments and nodes, basically, and some of the things that we're not going to talk about would be a very long uh, speech. Uh, data banks and roles. Uh, the main things about you know the way that we're using it is environments and nodes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we go. So what's an environment? An environment defines a type of machine. It can be a development machine, a production machine, a staging machine, wherever. But it's a type of machine. Uh, it's defined in a file named whatever you want dot JSON. So it's a JSON file, and you can see an example here. It's just, uh, there's nothing too yeah. much more to say about that, okay? You can set attributes for the cookbooks you have we inside have the pretty, environment. Yeah, we have a pretty well-defined, like, you know, files in our, in our Git repo, so you can <coughs> look at those. Yeah. So... It's just JSON. Yeah, after environment, you can find Node. Node, uh, as environments were a type of machine, a Node, it's a specific machine particular machine, okay? So in our case, we have a machine that's named balls.example.com. It's a JSON file, as it was an environment, and it has a very cute attribute named run list, and run list is a pretty important attribute, in fact, because uh, it will list every, res re every recipe that we, want, uh, that we want our nodes to get installed, okay? And not just which recipes, but in which order do those recipes have to be installed? So keep that in mind because it's very important. Every, uh, every recipe that we want to get installed has to be inside this uh, run list. So cookbooks, you are okay. pretty much a good cook. All right, yeah, I like the cookbooks. So, so the cookbooks, um, these define the recipes, specific instructions. They have uh, some other components in well as in, in, a, in a cookbook. A cookbook also uses templates. So I suppose you could use it for a lot of things, but we've been using it for like configuration files, right? So we have a, a prefab, a pre-cooked configuration yeah. file, right? Like for Apache, for example. Um, and in the, the Apache files, basically the apache.conf file is going to be more or less the same, uh, except on different environments, I may want to set different configurations, different amounts of memory and different paths and so on and so forth. So those things that change from one environment or one node to another, uh, I would set in an attributes file, right? So you can see it's got a quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of, um, of configurability, depending on how you want to set up and how you want to use it across different environments. There's also the concept of resources. So resources are they're like reusable class methods from other cookbooks, dependencies. Um, I think when you see in our in our code where you set up the uh, the PostgreSQL, uh, it, like it, it requires the Python cookbook in order to set up some of the to create the user for the database. It, it, for exactly right. <clears throat> so, so this is kind of what what cookbooks do. And you know, once again, you can download existing cookbooks, um, you know, from the supermarket or from from GitHub. You probably find a lot of them, or you can create your own. Um, creating your own kitchen is really easy. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through code here. Step um, one. But yeah, Step right. Yeah. This, so this is where I'm breaking my promise that I wasn't going to use code. But uh, just to show how easy it is, I was able to do knife solo init dot knife being the command line tool for Ruby, and it set up the entire directory structure for the for the kitchen, right? yeah. which was great. Um, setting up dependency management, which is called Berkshelf, it was also really easy. All I did was create a this Berks file. It's called Berks file in the root directory of a project. I list the source, which is the supermarket, and then I put in the different dependencies, different places, uh, different cookbooks that I want to grab in order to, to set up my machines. And those can be local, they can be remote, they can be from the supermarket, they can be from GitHub, et cetera. Um, and then creating your own cookbook is really easy, too. The, the, the tools that Chef and Chef Solo give you are, are, are really pretty good. So uh, I was just, I went into this, there's a directory called Site Cookbooks, which is where you keep your own uh, custom-made cookbooks or your or your extended cookbooks, um, and just by typing, you know, the command Burke's cookbook, my cookbook, it set up the entire cookbook structure for me. And all I have to do at that point is add a little bit of code to the uh, to the recipes default file, default RB, uh, and that's the one that's going to be run when the cookbook is called. So, like in this example, I think we're. Uh, setting in fact, up this is a this is a resource. Yeah, we were the, talking before yeah. about that. Uh, Chef uh, has many resources. One of them is Bash. It allows you to to run 
it allows you to run uh, command line, uh, command line. Uh, what? Yeah, command, command line code, command code. Command okay, commands, thank you. Right? Commands, yeah. uh, but there are more. I'm sorry, I'm not, uh, as you can see, English native speaker. Your so, English is great. What are you talking thank about? Thank you. It's better than mine. And we have uh, more resources. We can we have the resource Git, resource template. That yeah. every one of them is quite self-explanatory. There's there's a really pretty full set of uh, you know commands that that Chef uses. That you know it's really helpful to create files to uh, set permissions to. Um, you know, run bash commands, uh, set up networking parts. I don't know. There's yeah. there's a whole lot that you can do with it. So the point of this is just really to show that it is really pretty easy to get started. Um, the next thing you need to make sure and do, and we, we put this in because we suffered horribly about this because yes, a uh, lot <laughs> didn't realize that you had to do both of these things. You have to add it. You have to add your new cookbook to the dependency manager. Otherwise, it doesn't know it's there, and it will just ignore it. Uh, and if you want it to actually run, then you need to add it to the... Um, to the run list of the node. Right, to the run list of the node that you mentioned before. So those, we thought that was, uh, we had enough suffering on our side that it was yes. worth putting that into its own slide in our presentation. And tell it to you so you won't have to suffer. Yes. Okay, so we're, we're kind of getting towards the end here. I want to talk just a little bit about wrapper cookbooks. Um, this was an interesting concept for me in particular. The, as I've been saying, OpsCode has all these great cookbooks. Uh, in the supermarket that you can get and use. HTTP servers, databases, caching systems, uh, Python, PHP, Ruby, whatever you need. Um, and a lot of times they pretty much do what you need to do, but you might need to just tweak a few things, or you might need to set some sort of configuration that they hadn't included in the version that, that they've currently got published. So like my first temptation, actually the first thing I did was start cloning these from GitHub. Um, and then I realized that, you know, I'm kind of digging myself into a hole here. And I came across the concept of wrapper cookbooks, uh, which is actually a lot easier than trying to clone and, man clone and manage your own, your own cookbook. You simply uh, define a wrapper around one of the existing ones and add in the new functionality that you want to use. So it's really, you know, following the, the, the dry philosophy that we're all so fond of. Yeah. Um, if you do start using this technology, I recommend you take a look at this... Uh, a blog entry called Doing Wrapper Cookbooks Right by Julian Dunn. Uh, I guess I forgot to put the link in here, but just Google that and it'll come up. Everyone refers to it. It's very helpful. It's in the tutorial. Yeah. So in uh, summary, we're pretty much at the end here. You know, We hope you give it a try. Check out VirtualBox, Vagrant, and Chef for development environments. Uh, they're rep reproducible quickly and accurately. Everything's going to go into version control and get. You save a lot of time. It's cool, and they're, they're skills that... that you know, you can use in, in any project, really. You don't, it's not limited to Django at all. You know, we haven't really been talking about Django. We're talking about environments. So whether you, you have another project that's in some other language, PHP, uh, Ruby, whatnot, um, yeah, it's all, it's all valid for that. And uh, we do use it at DocuSign. So um, there's the link again. Do you want to check and see if that actually worked? The, yes. Uh, environment you were Let's trying to see if set up? It worked. I'm sorry. There it is. Okay, first it has to go out. Okay. Looks like it has ended the right way. So we just wait for it. Wait for it. And that's the amazing Pulse yeah. tutorial application. What's up? What's up? Not much. The sky, both. Thank you. Five volts against five volts. So vote again. Yes, please. Yeah. So we go can, into yeah. that page again. So it has worked. Yeah. So once you get the components, you can download. You can do Vagrant up and yeah. you get this amazing application. This running. very amazing application. It's very hard to do. On your local environment. Yeah. So thanks, everyone, for your time. Thanks for listening. If, if anyone has any questions, we'll try to answer them. As I said, we're not, we're not gurus, gurus on the topic, but uh, you know, we'll try to answer the best we can. And anybody who's interested in coming and hanging out with us in uh, San Francisco and Doc at DocuSign and doing some Django development. We'd love to speak to you afterwards, too. I think that people want to, wants to go to have a beer. It's yeah. the last speech. I know, I do. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. we'll do, we'll do. So, right. we'll do that. Okay. Thank you.